so it is my pleasure to um, uh, introduce our speaker this morning. Um, David Sowers has been here to speak with us before. Um, he works with international ministry at the Christian Campus House at MU. So please welcome David Sowers this morning. I almost feel like Taylor Swift when I hear those that music. No. <laughs> um, it's good to be with you again this morning. Uh, my wife and I are glad to be here. And um, I do want to mention uh, something. I forgot to mention this to David Hagemeyer a little bit ago. I got a request from Lance Tamarius, who is, uh, of course, he's preached here at different times as well. And apparently last night his... Uh, son-in-law was in a head-on collision in uh, his city with a drunk driver, and um, he was in the hospital several hours. He's out, but he had a seizure apparently as a result of a concussion. Uh, his name is Chase, and so please pray for Chase and uh, Alyssa, his wife, and, and uh, pray that Chase can get through this and recover completely. I don't know the condition of the other man who was in the uh, collision, but, uh, but at this point, I'd like for us to pray for them and as well as for the service. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for your constant presence with us. And right now, we pray that you will be with Chase. We ask you, Lord God, to bring complete healing to him as well as the other driver. Lord God, I pray that you will just strengthen all of their family. And this morning, Lord, as we launch into talking about... Um, an unlikely hero, Joseph, as well as about how we need to follow his example. We pray, Lord, that you will open our hearts. I pray, Lord God, that our desire might be to uh, just know you more and to have a, a closer relationship with you. And I pray, Lord, that that will be the, the desire of our hearts this morning. And I pray that you'll help me as I preach. In Jesus' name, amen. I appreciate what Dylan has said in this communion meditation this morning. We need to know who we are, where we've come from, where we're going. And in light of that, and that's very interesting, in light of that, this scripture in Romans 6, 11 to 14 really is presupposing all that as Christians. Um, here, Paul is wanting us to recognize who we are. And in light of that, he says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. And of course, at the beginning of that chapter, he started out by saying, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may increase? And he said, may it never be. Uh, and he tells us that because we were baptized into Christ, we were raised up to walk in newness of life with him. So again, this is what we're going to be focusing on this morning, uh, is realizing that, you know, we, we, need to, we need to live holy lives. Our desire to obey God, the help of the Holy Spirit in obeying God, and the instruction in Scripture in how to obey God are all essential in living for God like we really mean it. One of the most important purposes, speaking of the Scriptures, is found, in, uh, one of the most important scripture, purposes of the Old Testament Scriptures is described in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Here Paul says, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for reproof, or excuse me, for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 2.10 that we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So scripture properly understood helps then to equip us to carry out these good works that God has prepared beforehand for us to do. The biblical record of Joseph's life shows us a life of good works. How Joseph lived his life both motivates us and instructs us on how we are to live ours. 
You see, Joseph lived her, his life for God like he really meant it. And my goal this morning is to help us to resolve to do the same. Back in 2014, Acura used the slogan, Live Like You Mean It, as they presented the 2014 Acura ILX. Perhaps they meant that buying that car would show you that you were truly living life, in contrast to myself, and I'm sure some of you who are apparently not living life like we mean it because we do not drive back and forth to work in uh, Acuras, but in old vehicles. Um, and so live like you mean it was their focus. And then live like you mean it was also the theme for the music group, the Riff Raiders, who recorded a song that repeatedly says, live like you mean it. Then there's a book by T.J. Addington entitled, Live Like You Mean It, The Ten Crucial Questions That Will Help You Clarify Your Purpose, Live Intentionally, and Make the Most of the Rest of Your Life. And perhaps there's been times when after telling your wife that you loved her, guys, she's asked you, do you really mean it? Or perhaps there have been times when after um, you, you've announced to your children or grandchildren, hey, we're going to go on a uh, canoe trip this weekend on the current river, and they may have said, do you really mean it? And, you know, as, as brothers and sisters in Christ, if we were face-to-face -face with, with Jesus, would he ask us, do you really mean it when you call me Lord? And why might he ask us that question? Because it's just possible that we're calling him Lord, Lord, but not obeying what he has asked us or commanded us to do. So do we live for Jesus like we really mean it? Are we determined like Joseph to live a holy life in this very unholy world, to use our gifts responsibly and in love and continue trusting in the promises of God like Joseph did. You know, I meet with a lot of international students and visiting scholars to help them with their English. We have a conversation partner program at the Christian Campus House. And by the way, I just want to mention, if any of you are ever interested in coming along and and meeting with someone, say an international student who's requested a partner, please let me know because we just might have an opening where someone has asked to meet and they need someone. So just, just, uh, just to, to think about that. But at any rate, a few years ago, um, we had a, a man that I was meeting with from China. He was a visiting scholar. He's a professor back in China. And he became very attracted to the Christian message. In fact, he was going to Forum Christian Church every Sunday that he was here. And he came to believe in Christ. And so he told me at the time, he said, if I become a Christian, I'm going to give it 100%. But while he was still here, an obstacle came up. In fact, an obstacle which poses one of the biggest obstacles to people becoming Christians today. And I'd been meeting with him for several weeks when he asked me this question. He said, why do Christians do bad things? I just don't understand it. He recognized, of course, that Jesus' life and teachings were not consistent with the actions of some Christians he had observed. When he said this, I winced I, because the poor witness of some Christians was a roadblock in the way of my friend's salvation. So he was having second thoughts. Now, he's still not a Christian, as far as I know, though I believe the main reason now is the repression of the Chinese government. He's afraid of what they might do to his family if he becomes a Christian. But at any rate, excuse me, if my friend were to watch you and me for a week or, and see our words, our actions, our attitudes, what kind of impression would he come away with? If he was a fly on the wall in your home, what would he think about your faith and your love for Jesus after he saw your conversations and interactions with your husband or your wife, your kids, or your grandkids? If my friend were to observe you at work, what would he see? Would he say, why does this Christian live like this and do and say the bad things he or she does? Is this person really a Christian at all? Or would he say, I'm impressed the Jesus I read about in the Bible is the same Jesus I see living in this person's life. He's the same guy at home as he is in public. Or she's the same woman at home as she is in church. 
You know, like many of you, I've been growing in holiness throughout my life because of the Holy Spirit's work in me and in you, and we praise God for that, but I have to confess that there have been times when I wouldn't have wanted my Chinese friend to have witnessed my words or my actions at home. I would have been ashamed of them, and I'm sure you feel the same way, but the great thing, though, for us is that as 1 John 4, 4 says, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Sin can and must become more and more of the exception in our lives rather than the norm, and, and this can and done, does happen as we walk by the Holy Spirit. I can testify to that as well, that the amount and frequency of sin in my life is much less now than it was years ago because God has helped me to grow and to overcome so many of those things that plagued me as sins in the past. And he, he is doing the same for you as you resolve to walk with him. We have to decide to do that, of course. We can't. It's not going to happen automatically without our desire to walk with God. Some 3,900 years ago, we find that the unlikely hero Joseph was a man who lived for God like he really meant it. But despite the fact that Joseph stands for us as a hero for God, he was an unlikely hero. He came from a family that was really messed up and very dysfunctional. His dad, Jacob, had married two wives and had two concubines. And you can just imagine the jealousy and the competition that existed among the women in this situation, let alone the kids. These four women had bore him a total of 13 children, one daughter and 12 sons. Joseph was the 11th son. A few years earlier, before Joseph's teen years, after Rachel, his mother Rachel's death, Joseph's oldest brother Reuben had slept with Rachel's servant, who was one of his father's concubines. This was a terrible violation of trust and of the marriage bed. And not only that, but two of Joseph's brothers, Simeon and Levi, had committed murder by slaughtering all the men in the city of Shechem for the sin of one man, his name was actually Shechem, who had violated their sister Dinah. Suffice it to say, Joseph's brothers were not good men. And on top of it, Joseph reported the bad behavior of some of his brothers to his dad, which made things even worse for him. I remember as a kid, um, my uncle, my youngest uncle actually was just eight years older than me, and, and uh, we were outside one day, and, and I loved baseball, and he, he loved baseball, so he was throwing me some ground balls to practice fielding, you know, and well, the backyard had all these roots from the tree, and so that ball was going along, hit a root, and popped up right in my mouth, you know. I was so mad at him, I blamed him, you know, I'm going to go tell Grandma. He said, tattletale, tattletale, hanging on bull's tail, you know, that's what he said. And uh, so, <laughs> and that's what happened here. Joseph would tell his dad what his brothers were doing, and the things he told his dad were not good. Well, since Joseph was the first son of Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel, Jacob favored him over his other sons. As his favored son, he made him a richly ornamented coat, which caused his brothers to become very jealous. And further, Joseph had some dreams which depicted his family bowing down to him. This really made his brothers hate him, and even his own dad, Jacob, questioned this but wondered about what it, it meant. One day when Joseph was 17, Jacob sent him to check on his brothers who were um, pasturing his flock. The brothers saw him coming from a long ways off, and they saw their chance. They said, hey, let's get rid of him. We can kill him. We can get rid of him once and for all. But Reuben said, no, he's, he's our own flesh and blood. We're not going to kill him. So they stuck him down in a cistern, a dry cistern. Well, Reuben evidently had to be gone for a little bit. And his brothers, in the meantime, saw these Midianite traders coming along, and they sold Joseph to these guys as a slave for 20 shekels of silver, 20 pieces of silver, and this, which was the price of a slave. And the brothers, being the liars that they were, and unwilling to admit what they had done, dipped Joseph's coat into the blood of a slaughtered animal and showed it to Jacob and said, do you recognize this coat? And Jacob immediately concluded that a wild animal had killed Joseph. And he went into an inconsolable grief that just lasted for years. Meanwhile, Joseph was taken down to Egypt and became a slave in Potiphar's household. And Potiphar was, uh, had a very high position as captain of the guard. And for the next 13 years, now I want you, I want you to think about this. 
For the next 13 years, from age 17 to age 30, Joseph was either a slave or in prison for things he, had, he was not guilty of. Okay, talk about injustice. He was, in, he was either a prisoner or a slave for 13 years from age 17 to age 30. And I bring this up because there are many times where all of us face the difficulties of life and we wonder, why is God allowing this to happen to me? You know, should I even serve God anymore, you know? Well, Joseph did. Joseph, Joseph was enduring all of this hardship, but he didn't give up on God. He still knew that God was with him, and God was with him. And God had a plan that he was working out in his life. And that's something I want us to remember as well, is that sometimes through the difficulties that we deal with, God is working through those things to bring about even better things. And that was certainly the case here. Well, Joseph ultimately, he, he was in prison, and two of Pharaoh's servants were stuck in prison with him. And they both had dreams. And when Joseph heard of that, he said, well, God, God knows the answer to the meanings of your dreams. And so he correctly interpreted them. And the one man was executed, the one man was freed. And he told the man that was freed, he said, hey, rem when you get out of here, remember me and put in a good word for me. Well, the guy forgot all about it. And two more years go by until Pharaoh has his dreams. And then the man remembered, ah, he said, there's a Hebrew slave in prison that correctly interpreted my dream and the dream of the other guy, the baker, and it came out exactly as he had said. And you might, you might talk to him, and so they brought Joseph in, and of course, Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dream with God's help. He always gave credit to God, and then he recommended a course of action, and he said, you need to get a guy who's able to do this, 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 Pharaoh said, who else better than you, you know? And so he became second highest ruler in the land of Egypt. I mean, this was a big deal. So from the lowest level to the highest level, really, is what happened with Joseph. God was working things out. So if anyone could have used the excuse of being in, raised in bad circumstances with bad examples around him, Joseph could have, but he didn't. And as we've already seen, there was a great contrast between the way he lived and the way his brothers lived. And not only that, there was also a great contrast between, the way, between Joseph's view of God's faithfulness in keeping his promises as well as his control over history. Joseph lived his life as a blessing to those people around him, but never forgot the big picture. God was working out his plan for Israel, and in time would take them from the land of Canaan back, or take them back to the land of Canaan. And this is why Joseph, before he died, ordered his brothers to make sure that his bones would be taken back into the land of Canaan when God fulfilled his promises. And that's exactly what happened when a few hundred years later, Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt. They took Joseph's bones with them. And this is also why in the, what we call the faith chapter of Hebrews chapter 11, it says, by faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. Joseph lived by faith, and his focus was ultimately on God's sure fulfillment of his promises. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, I want us to think about, think hard about our witness and the legacy we want to leave. In truth, we are writing our legacy through every word, every act, and every thought that we have. 3,900 years ago, Joseph left a great legacy as he lived for God like he meant it. Now, very interestingly, about 100 years ago, exactly, actually, another man, a Christian man, left a great legacy as well at the Olympics in Paris, of all places, and that was Eric Little. As the most promising runner Scotland had ever known, Little was chosen to speak for the Glasgow Student Evangelical Union, or abbreviated as GSEU, because he was so well known. The GSEU hoped that he would draw large crowds so that many people would hear the gospel. The GSEU would send out a group of eight to ten men to an area where they would stay with the local population. 
And it was Little's job to be the lead speaker and to evangelize the men of Scotland. Many came to see him because he was an accomplished athlete, but all heard the word of God from him. So Little, a great all-around athlete, was best in the 100 meters. In fact, in 1923, he had set the world record in the 100 meters. And he was signed up to, to run that race in the 1924 Olympics, but the time trials were on Sunday. And because of his personal convictions about that and keeping Sunday as a day set apart entirely for God, he would not run. He did not agree to run, even under great pressure from others around him who wanted him to cave in on his principles. He wouldn't do it. But there was another race that he decided to run that was not run on Sunday, and that was the 400 meters. He was not, that was not his best race. But he still entered the 400 meters and went through the, the qualifying runs and got up to the final, the final race. And as he went to the starting block, an unknown man slipped a piece of paper into his hand with a quotation from 1 Samuel 2, verse 30. Those who honor me, I will honor. And though the 400 meters, again, was not the race in which he was the strongest, he not only won the race, but he set the world record for the race, which stood for over 20 years before it was finally broken. He ran it in 47.6 seconds. It's faster than most of us can run that, probably. Um, <laughs> the movie Chariots of Fire, if you've ever seen that movie, actually does a great job of showing Eric Little's devotion to Christ. His life is like Joseph's in that sense, in that he stood for God even in difficult situations. And 1 Peter 2 verse 9 says that we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. And earlier Peter had written these words in 1 Peter 1, 13 to 16, which, words which I especially want us to focus upon this morning throughout the rest of the message. He says, therefore, prepare your minds for action, be self-controlled, set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. And really that brings us to our main point this morning, which I've already talked about. And that is that as, as brothers and sisters in Christ and as the church, and like the Old Testament example of Joseph, we must be a holy people in an unholy world. And despite opposition and despite insults, we must live for Jesus like we mean it. So how can we be a holy people in an unholy world and live for Jesus like we mean it? We're not saying like in the sense of faking it. We're talking about sincerely living for Jesus. First of all, like Joseph, we can be a holy people in an unholy world by understanding what holiness is. So what does it really mean to be holy? Well, to be holy means to be set apart, to be distinct or different. It is to be separated from that which is common and sinful. The same is true of the word sanctify. To sanctify is to set something apart as holy. We Christians have been sanctified. We've been set apart. That's why we're called saints, holy ones whom God has set apart for as his own people. And the New Testament words saint, sanctify, holy, and holiness all come from the same family of Greek words, which means to be set apart. Now, a lot of people think that a holy person is like a monk who is, is in a monastery. He's set apart. He's not around the people of the world. He's, he's separated himself from the normal, ordinary events of the world in order to live a holy life. And the same would be true of a holy woman. She uh, would be one who ideally would be a nun, and live in a convent away from the distractions and temptations of the world where she would completely dedicate her life to the worship of God. But to separate ourselves physically from the world usually doesn't bring holiness. Plus, this isn't real life for most of us, and it certainly wasn't for Joseph, who, as we see in Genesis 39, refused the advances of Potiphar's wife. Listen to Joseph's response to her. Look, he said to his master's wife, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in his house, and he has put all that he owns under my authority. 
No one in this house is greater than I am. He has withheld nothing from me except you because you are his wife. So how could I do this immense evil? How can I sin against God? You see, Joseph recognized that just like David did in Psalm 51 where he's confessing his sin with Bathsheba, he recognized that all sin is ultimately against God. It doesn't just stop with the person that we've sinned against. It actually extends to God who we have violated his law. Now, for you and me to escape the possibility that we might hear bad language or see immoral behavior or dress, we could escape to the monastery or convent, but God has not called us to do that. But neither has he called us to purposefully expose ourselves to media sources or to people that bring immoral behavior directly to our eyes, minds, and heart. Again, Joseph is our example here. After Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him, the Bible's text said that as she spoke to him day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her, or to be with her. He did not expose himself willingly to temptation. And the truth is, Christ calls you and me to be in the world but not of it. And by being in the world but not of it, we testify to the nations and to the peoples of the world of the greatness of God and his holiness. Joseph's life was different, and people could see that. Your life and my life needs to be different so people can see that too. In a tremendous psalm, Psalm 67 brings out this point in terms of God's holiness being uh, manifest to the world. He says, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you rule the peoples justly and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. Then the land will yield its harvest, and God, our God, will bless us. God will bless us, and all the ends of the earth will fear him. This brings us to our second point, and that is this. Like Joseph, we can be a holy people in an unholy world by desiring holiness. I love the old song. I, I say old. It's not really old. Uh, it, it, it's the song... Um, Holiness goes, holiness, holiness is what I long for. Holiness is what I need. Holiness, holiness is what you want from me. And indeed, it is what God wants from us. And Joseph knew that. I'm sure that Potiphar's wife and her scheming had made herself as attractive as possible. She was using oil of Olay and all the other stuff that you can buy and, and uh, makeup and perfume and all this. But Joseph, because he desired holiness was ready for the unexpected temptation when it came. The runner Eric Little desired holiness in his life. That's why he took a stand. And, and even though, yes, running on Sunday is a matter of opinion, yet we know from Romans 14 that we are not to violate those matters of opinion if we have a strong conscience about something. And he was not willing to violate that. And that shows his desire for holiness. Another thing he said, on one occasion, he said, God made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. How has God gifted you, and do you sense God's pleasure with you as you fulfill his will in your life? Like Joseph and Eric Little, let's desire holiness in our lives too. So what motivations help us to be holy when we are surrounded by so much that is unholy? Well, the passage, passage we've already read from 1 Peter chapter 1 shows us four motives. First of all, we are motivated by the character of God. God says, you shall be holy because I am holy. Because God is holy, we want to be like him. We want to be holy in that sense. Second, we are motivated by the call of God. Notice that verse 15 says, as he who called you is holy. God has called us through the gospel message. He has said, I want you to be in a relationship with me through faith in my son, Jesus Christ. And it isn't only that God's character is holy, though it is, it's that the God whose character is holy has also seen fit to call us into a wonderful relationship with him. The Lord's Supper that we just partook of, you know why we partake of it? Because Jesus invited us to do that. Isn't that wonderful? 
that God invites us, he calls us, he wants you to be a part of his family. And so that motivates us then to, to live for him. Now, think of your families for a moment. You men are in a special relationship with your wives and vice versa. And as children, you are in a special relationship with your parents and vice versa. Now, those relationships are a powerful motivating factor in what we do and don't do in living life. Um, similarly, as saved people, we are in God's family, and we know God, and that motivates us to live a holy life. And third, we're motivated by the command of God. And, you know, while we treasure our relationship with God as our Heavenly Father, we also recognize another facet of God's character. He is Lord of all. He owns everything. He is in control of everything. And at times, such as when our rebellious natures crop up, we tend to ask, why shouldn't I have my freedom? Why shouldn't I have the right to do what I want to do? Why shouldn't I be able to choose the gender I want or do whatever I want to do? Um, don't I live in a free country? Shouldn't I be able to demand my rights? Well, ultimately, submission to the Lordship of our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, squashes all such rebellion. You may not appreciate all of God's commands. You may not always understand them. You may not always even like them, but it doesn't matter. We obey anyway because we trust in him and we love him. He is our God. We reverence him and we know that he knows what is best, even when we don't. That's something I think that as American Christians especially, we have to really get a handle on. And that is the fact that, yes, we live in a free country, and we don't like the trends that we see in our nation where freedoms are being taken away. But just remember that, first of all, we are under the lordship of Christ. We follow him regardless of what our nation is doing. Okay, that's number one. But number four here, as far as motivations, we are motivated by the choice of God. You might notice that our passage we read today, starting in chapter 1, verse 13, begins with the word, therefore. Now, you've heard this before, I'm, I'm sure. Whenever you see the word, therefore, you have to ask, why is it therefore? Um, and in this case, one of the important points that Peter makes is found in chapter 1, verse 1, when he calls us the elect, or the chosen, according to God's foreknowledge of us. God, of course, did not have to choose to save anyone. We were all condemned due to our sins, but God is gracious. God's intention was that we be saved. In fact, 2 Peter 3.9 says, God does not want anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance. He provided the means for that salvation, his very own son, and he provided the opportunity for faith to arise in our hearts as we heard the gospel preached to us. And God's Spirit convicted us through that preached word of our sins and our need for a Savior. And God, because of his infinite knowledge, knows in advance those who will choose to follow him. And based upon that foreknowledge, he has predestined those people to be his people, to be conformed to the image of his son. He never forces or chooses people against their will to be saved. The New Testament is clear that each of us has a responsibility to choose to accept God's offer of salvation. And the point here with respect to holy living is that in light of God's choice of us to come into his salvation through his foreknowledge of our free will decision, we must remember that this salvation always includes holiness. Ephesians 1, 4 says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. God really does want a holy people. Joseph knew that and lived it out in his life, and so did Eric Little. About three years ago, an uh, Iranian family, the, the wife decided to become a Christian. And we were in the living room, seated there before her baptism that night. And her husband, who had not become a Christian at that point and still has not, we're st still praying for him, but he, her husband made a, a comment that I, I thought was so important. He said, the reason that we are interested in in following Jesus, or the reason that we're interested in this message is because of the way all of you are living your lives. He was that, and I'm by no means, I, 
as far from perfect as you can imagine, but still God has used Christians, myself and many others, in their lives to be a witness and a testimony to him. God has changed us, and he saw that, and that attracted him. And people will be attracted by you as you live that holy life as well. They will see a difference between you and others who are not living for God. So God chooses to give us to this, and in his foreknowledge, he chooses those who respond to it in faith. Third, like Joseph, we can be a holy people in an unholy world by steady growth in God-likeness and Christ-likeness. The New Testament speaks of two aspects of holiness for the believer. The first aspect of that of holiness is being set apart as God's people when we believed in Christ and were baptized into him. We have been out of Christ, and now we're in Christ. Just like I was so glad to hear about the six who were baptized, the three there and the three here. Um, the, this idea of being baptized into Christ means that we were not in him, but now we are, because through faith in what God has done through Christ on the cross, we can have this salvation. The Bible calls this, what God does in us, regeneration, which is the beginning of of our being set apart as God's people. And so sometimes this has been called initial sanctification or the point when we were born again, set apart, regenerated. But in order to, for God's spirit to effectively work within us to become more and more like Jesus, we must become submitted to him. But there's a second aspect of holiness for the Christian in the, in the New Testament, and that is an ongoing or progressive sanctification. We're becoming more and more like Jesus the longer we live, as we walk with him. As you look back over your Christian life, have you allowed God to progressively make you into a better person, a person more and more like Jesus? You know, we, we all stumble and fall from time to time, but are the times of that falling into sin becoming less and less? Now, sometimes I know it seems like three steps forward, two steps back, but it needs to be a progression as we walk by faith. And although Peter doesn't discuss it here, the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us the power and the strength to live this holy life, as Paul says in Romans 8 and Galatians 5. So we have divine help. We need that divine help. We need God's help to live a holy life. I know our students, uh, and I pray for them frequently, our students at the Christian Campus House, um, the atmosphere on campus is often not a holy atmosphere, just to put it bluntly. And it's difficult for our kids to live a holy life in that environment. It's difficult for anyone to, and that's why we need God's help to do that. And of course, as Acts 2.42 says, they continue steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine, which is what we're doing here, breaking of bread, which is what we did a little bit ago, fellowship, which is joining together in a common cause for Christ, and in prayer. All of those things help us as a church to live this holy life. So God's strength is present with us, but you and I also have responsibilities to walk with God's Spirit and seeing this sanctification happen. And our first responsibility mentioned in 1 Peter 1.13 is a well-ordered mind. He says, prepare your minds for action. Literally, the phrase is, gird up the loins of your minds. How do you think men in ancient times were able to run? Well, because they had tucked those robes into their belt so they could run. Our minds are so important to protect and to guard, and in order to be holy, we must prepare our minds and exercise discipline in the use of them. Our minds must be focused on God and on holy living, and if they are, then we can succeed with the help of God's Spirit, but they're, if they're not, we're not going to succeed. We need to be careful about what we feed our minds. Our cell phones. Our cell phones are just, uh, they're, they're great tools, but they're also traps. And we have to be very, very careful how we use those, both from the standpoint of leading us to pornographic sites, as well as just wasting our time, the time that God has given us. We need to be disciplined in our use of not just that media source, but our computers, television, whatever. Um, we need to ask ourselves, how about the computer games I play? 
are those glorifying to God? Are those leading my mind to go in directions that I don't want it to go? Um, what TV programs am I watching? What books am I reading? All of these things, we, we need to have a well-ordered mind, prepare our minds for action. And the second responsibility is a well-disciplined life. Peter says in verse 13, be sober. And the word used here can be translated as sober or self-controlled. As one man put it, to identify with Christ is to be against what he is against and for what he is for. This means that as the church, we must recognize who we serve and what serving Christ means in the real world in everyday life. Lying, stealing, lusting, gossiping, slandering, losing our tempers is not part of living a sober or well-disciplined life. These are contrary to God's will. And our third responsibility in holy living is a well-defined goal. Peter says in verse 13, for us to set our hope firmly upon the grace to be given to us when Jesus Christ is revealed. In, in chapter 1, verse 4, Peter tells us of the nature of this hope. He says it is a sure hope, a sure hope in an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for us. The wonderful promises of God keep us living holy lives for him. Joseph saw the big picture. Think of this. Think of after all that they had done. And if you read that section in Genesis, it's fascinating. Here his brothers come because they're starving back in Canaan. They come and they bow down before this guy that they don't even know is their brother. But he knows who they are. And after a series of very interesting interactions, he finally reveals who he was, and they were petrified. They were just scared to death. And they wondered, is he going to... I mean, he had the right of life and death over them. But he forgave them because he saw God's purposes. Our fourth responsibility is a well-established conversion. Peter said in verse 14, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. We need to recognize what happened when we were baptized into Christ. And Paul tells us in Titus 3, verses 4 through 7, he says, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Something happened when you were baptized into Christ. God did something in your life. He regenerated you. He made you into a new person. And because of that, you have the capacity now to live a holy life for him. Going back to Eric Little, it was his faith and trust in the promises of God that drove him. So what is the rest of his story? Well, after graduation from college, he returned to North China, where he served as a missionary from 1925 to 1943. During World War II, Japan fought against China, putting the lives of missionaries at risk. And when the fighting reached Xiaochang, the Japanese took over the mission station and in 1943, Eric was interned at the Weixian internment camp with members of the China Inland Mission. He became a leader at the camp and helped get it organized, but supplies began to run, run short, he, he, and he got sick. And in 1945, he died as a result of a brain tumor. He was greatly mourned, not only at the camp, but also in Scotland as well. And at the core of his life, Eric believed that God was his savior, his friend, his companion, and everything he did, he felt, should give God pleasure. And as a runner, he was the fastest and had achieved the highest glory. And as a believer in Christ, he found that his greatest strength came from God. His running was only a means to the main goal in his life, and that was to glorify and praise God. Joseph and Eric Little, men who lived over three millennia apart, and yet men who were very much alike in their determination to please God. They were men who lived for God like they meant it. And I want us to live for Jesus like we mean it as well. And may God help us to stay away from sin in our lives, to live a holy life, and to glorify him through the way we live. Let's pray. Lord in heaven, I thank you so much for this 
opportunity this morning for us to consider the lives of Joseph and Eric Little and consider your word, Lord, what you ask us to do. We pray that you will help us, Lord, to desire more than anything else, Lord, to glorify you, to live holy lives for you so that others may see that and it may help them, Lord, to follow you as well. In Jesus' name, amen.